All right, welcome to our lesson today where we're going to be taking a look a little bit more in depth at the sorting algorithms we've been working with over the last couple of days. And we're going to be trying to compare those algorithms to each other to see which ones are the best ones that we'd want to work with. Now, when we want to compare a variety of algorithms together, there are a variety of ways we can do that. The first is called algorithm complexity. And this is basically taking a look at how confusing the code is to try and write. The second one is algorithm structure, or what is the basic um, method we are going to use to divide or sort our particular array. The third is the computational complexity, or how hard it is for the computer to sort the data. How long is it going to take the computer to go through and sort what we're trying to sort. And number four would be the memory usage. How much extra memory is it going to be required by our computer in the sorting algorithm we're going to use. And then finally, the array stability. So when I try and switch the data around in my array, how stable is it? How likely is it to remain sorted when I sort for another attribute? So the first one we had is the algorithm complexity. So again, this is a comparison of the overall complexity of the code that I need to have in order to write this algorithm. And in this case, because we're working with an introductory Java course, um, all three of these algorithms are relatively simple. There are many other sorting algorithms out there that are much more complex to try and code than the ones that we've been looking at in class. Algorithm structure. So again, this is a comparison of the general style or the type of algorithm. What is the underlying mechanism used to sort our array? So we can have a swap sort, which is when you take two items and swap the positions that they contain in the array. We can have a merge sort, which divides our array into an unsorted portion and a sorted portion. And then we try and take each unsorted element and put it into the sorted position until our whole array becomes sorted. We also have a tree sort, um, which places data in a binary tree. So basically, you have one piece of data up at the top, and then you can either go this way or this way to come up with your next piece of data where it would go, and each of those can be broken around. So you can see how it's binary, because you either go one way or another until eventually you get to a sorted array, and here would be my data at the bottom, all sorted in a row. Okay, And there are some other algorithm structures out there that are a little bit more complex. We're not going to go into them in this course, but if you were to go on into programming, you might find some other structures out there. So the structures that we've been working with in our bubble sort, that is a swap-based sort because we're swapping individual elements as we bubble the largest element to the end of the array. The selection sort is also swap-based because when this particular sorting algorithm, we're going to find the lowest valued element and swap it with the element at the beginning of the array. The insert sort is an example of a merge-based sort where we were merging our unsorted elements into the sorted side. So our third way of comparing algorithms was computational complexity. This comparison is based on the processing time of the algorithm. How long is it going to take the computer to do whatever it is we're asking it to do? Usually, we base this on the number of comparisons that are going to have to be made between the elements in our array. Because it can be difficult to compute the number of swaps. Um, for each comparison we make, we know we have to make that comparison, but we may or may not actually swap the elements as a result of that comparison. So we don't really know how many times we're going to swap, but we do know the number of times that we're going to compare one element to another element. The processing time can change as a result of the complexity or amount of disarray of the data to be sorted. So what this means is that um, if my array is already almost completely sorted and I only have one element out of order, it's probably going to take a lot less time to sort that array than if I had another array of the same size where the data was completely messed up and every single element had to be sorted. Um, so because we have a different amount of time that it could take, we can often an analyze a best case scenario a worst case scenario, and then sort of an average case scenario when we try and out evaluate our processing time. Generally, programmers want to know the efficiency of their programs when there's a large amount of data. Because if we're only working with 10 or 100 or even 1,000 elements in our array, it really isn't going to take all that much time to sort it, regardless of the algorithm we're going to use. But if I have a program that has to sort millions or even billions of pieces of data, um, the type of algorithm I use can make a significant change to the amount of time that it takes to process that data. So we evaluate this used, using something called O-notation. 
and O notation is basically a mathematical language for evaluating the running time of algorithm, algorithms. What I want to know is uh, using O notation is what is the rate of growth going to be? So as I increase in n, or as I increase in the amount of data in my array, am I going to have a linear increase in the amount of time? So it's going to be like a straight line. So for every n, I have uh, the same sort of rate of increase. Or is it going to be something like quadratic, which would increase at a much more drastic rate? Okay, um, or it could be a, a, a rate of one, which is constant. Um, and there are logarithmic uh, evaluations as well. There's a whole bunch of different rates of growth we could work with here. Um, when we're using O notation, we typically are trying to evaluate the worst case scenario because that is the um, extreme example of what we might incur when we try and sort our data. So let's take a look at our, our three different sorts that we're working with and figure out how complex they are. So if we're working the bubble sort, and let's say I have an array of 10 elements, how many times would I compare elements in that array? So remember, as a bubble sort, the first time through my, my array, I'm going to have to make nine comparisons, right? So I'm going to compare the first two, then the next two, then the next two, the next two, all the way through all the elements in my array, sorting in a number of nine comparisons. The next time through my array, the last position has already been bubbled up, or the greatest numbers have already been bubbled up to the end, so now I don't have to check that one anymore. So I only have to make eight comparisons, and then seven comparisons, six comparisons, five, and so on, until the last time through I don't have to make any more comparisons. If I add up all those number of comparisons I had to make in an array of ten elements, I end up with a total of 45 comparisons. So if I don't know the number of elements, and I'm just going to work with n elements in this case, how many comparisons would I make? Well, the first time, I'd have to make n minus 1 comparisons, right? I had 10, I made 9 comparisons. I have 100, I'd make 99 comparisons. I have n, I make n minus 1 comparisons. Then n minus 2, then n minus 3, and so on until I get to 2 plus 1 plus 0. If I were to add all those up, I get the formula of n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Now remember, if I was to calculate here, this would be the same as saying 10 times 9 divided by 2, 9 divided by 2 be 45, 4.5, 4.5 times 10 gets you my total of 45. So there's the formula that I would have in order to try and make this particular bubble sort comparison. And again, remember, this is the maximum number of comparisons I'd have for a worst case scenario. If I simplify that formula, I can get something that looks like this, n squared minus n over 2. And remember, all I'm really concerned about is how fast is the rate of increase going to happen. Is it a rate of 1? Is it constant? Is it a linear increase? Or is it a quadratic increase? So in this case, I can ignore all this stuff. Because even if there's a linear built in with a quadratic, the, the, the rate of increase is basically based on the quadratic uh, increase here, so the n squared. So this particular bubble sort has a growth rate of n squared comparisons. So as I increase n, I'm going to be fairly rapidly increasing the number of comparisons I make. Now keep in mind that although I'm basing it on the number of comparisons I'm making, I can still also sort of look at the number of swaps. Because in this case, we know there's going to be fewer swaps than there are comparisons. Because if any, any two elements are only swapped if we require. So the only way I'm going to have the maximum number of swaps is if it's 100% out of order. Otherwise, I'm going to have less swaps occurring. If my data is randomly sorted or it's an average array of data, a swap is probably going to be necessary about 50% of the time, so there's going to be half as many swaps as there are comparisons. Now if we look at the same thing for selection sort, well selection sort works the same way, right? I'm going to be going through each individual item and checking that each item, is it going to be the smallest one? And so I compare n minus 1 items, find the smallest one, and then do a swap. Then I compare again, one less, because this one's already been sorted here, one less, find the next smallest one, and then swap, and so on. So again, I'm going to have the exact same formula for number of comparisons here as I did with the bubble sort, which works out to a big O notation of n squared. Now this, uh, although it votes, uh, um, works out to the same amount of complexity as the bubble sort did, the number of swaps we perform will actually be much lower, because in this case, I'm only swapping exactly one time for each element I have. So on only 10 swaps for 10 elements. This results in a large case, if I have a large n value, I'm going to have much quicker sorting in this case. And then finally we have the insert sort. Now this array works in the reverse order of the other two. 
So again, the first item, so again, if I have my values here, value, 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 I've broken it up to sorted and unsorted. I really have to have to make one comparison here. I'm comparing to just this value. So this time I'm only making one comparison. This time I'm making one, two comparisons. This time I'm making one, two, three comparisons. So I'm going upwards um, from one to two to three to four up to n minus one comparisons. So again, this will work out to the same number of comparisons, which evaluates to the same level of complexity of an n squared increase. But now remember, in an insert sort, only about half the time am I actually going to be having to compare until I find where it's supposed to live. Because in this case, let's say this value is supposed to be in between these two. Once I find where it lives, I'm done. I don't actually need to make the rest of these comparisons into this part here. So in an average case scenario, this algorithm becomes twice as fast as the bubble sort because on average, I'm only making half the number of comparisons. So for large numbers of data that are randomly sorted, insert sort becomes your best um, sorting algorithm. Now the next way of comparing our algorithms is the amount of memory that we require. So we do this, we have to look at how much memory we have to uh, use, not including the actual array itself, because that's going to be constant no matter what algorithm we use. We have to store that amount of stuff in memory. But how much extra memory do we have to require in order to make our array get sorted? And in this case, it's a very minimal amount of memory that we have to use. In fact, we only need one variable so we can use temporary swapping of data. Um, there are other sorting algorithms that actually require you to make full comp copies of the entire array. Um, so in that case, you're actually going to be um, sacrificing the amount of memory, uh, you're using way more memory, but those sorting algorithms tend to be a lot more quick on the computational side. So you have to start weighing into, do you want to sacrifice memory or do you want to sacrifice processing speed? And then finally, we look at the stability of our sorting algorithm. And this is, uh, we want to see if the data remains in the same order when we sort for multiple attributes. What I mean by that is if you sort a list of people by first name, so I've arranged all the names by first name, um, but I've already arranged them by last name, so they're arranged by last name, now I want to sort for first name. Will people with the same first name still show up in the correct order based on their last name or not? Okay? That means that it is stable. If that works, if the last name stays sorted, even though we're sorting for the new first name, that means it's stable. And in this case, all three of these algorithms are stable. And again, this is something you can sacrifice for a more efficient method, but it would no longer be stable. Okay? That's it. That's all we have for today. We'll see you in class tomorrow where we'll practice what we've learned.